it's Chris Kresser. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. This week, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Kenneth Brown. He received his medical degree from the University of Nebraska Medical School and completed his fellowship in gastroenterology in San Antonio, Texas. He's a board-certified gastroenterologist and has been in practice for the past 15 years with a clinical focus on inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS. For the past 10 years, he's been doing clinical research for various pharmacologic companies. It was during these years that he saw the unmet need for something natural that could help his IBS patients. He'd been working on the development of a Trantil for the past six years and officially launched a Trantil one year ago. He developed this product with the intent of helping those suffering from the symptoms of IBS, which we now know are caused by bacterial overgrowth. So I reached out to Dr. Brown because we started to use a Trantil in our practice at California Center for Functional Medicine and had some good results with it. And there definitely is a lack of treatments that are effective and safe to use over the long term uh, for SIBO in general, but particularly for methane predominant SIBO and also for constipation predominant IBS. And so when I learned about Atrantil and Dr. Brown's work here and the research that he's done on it so far, I wanted to have him on the show to talk about it further. So without further ado, let's, let's dive in. Hey everyone, if you're like most people I know, you don't have the time or the desire training for that matter to sift through the hundreds of medical studies that are published each month. But whether you're struggling with a chronic health problem or just wanna maintain your health and live as long as possible, it's important to stay informed about the latest research and how it might affect your well-being. And let's face it, it's easy to get overwhelmed by all the conflicting stories in the media. You need a source of unbiased information that you can rely on, one that's easy to understand without too much jargon and full of practical tips that you can put into action. That's where my website, chriscresser.com, comes in. You'll find in-depth, evidence-based articles on a wide range of health and nutrition topics each week. You'll also find over 10 free ebooks on subjects like effortless weight loss, healing your gut, thyroid disorders, and natural skin care, as well as online classes and programs on optimizing nutrition for fertility and pregnancy and lowering your cholesterol without drugs. What you won't find is any third-party advertising, corporate influence, or hype-driven, headline-grabbing stories with a lot of drama but no substance. You just get the real inside scoop on the health issues that matter to you most. So head over to chriscresser.com and check it out. And when you sign up for my email newsletter, you'll get instant access to my award-winning 63-page ebook, Nine Steps to Perfect Health. It's like an instruction manual for preventing and reversing disease and living a long and healthy life. Okay, now back to the show. Dr. Brown, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here. Oh, Chris, thank you so much for having me on your show. So I thought we could just start with a little bit about your background and what led you into research on SIBO and, and IBS, particularly constipation predominant IBS. Yeah, so I'm actually a practicing uh, gastroenterologist in the uh, Dallas, Texas area. And I've been doing clinical research for the last 10 years as well. And this all kind of started when we were doing research for Salix at the time on Zyfaxin. And I think you've had Dr. Pimentel as a guest on your show. Yeah. And that's when uh, him and I came in contact and we were trying to help fill their study. And that's when he noted that uh, SIBO uh, would be a really big problem and it's a very exciting time to be involved with it. He demonstrated with rat models at that time the difficulty it would be to get rid of bloating and constipation in all those people that actually have methane. And the mm -hmm. way that they were going really was not going to work with just Zyfaxin. Right. So it was literally 10 years ago where I was like, wow, so if we could figure out the methane aspect of this, we would really be onto something really cool. Mm -hmm. And that's initially where all the ideas kind of started. Great. So I'm going to step back just for my listeners who aren't as familiar with all the terms we're throwing around here. But many of you who've been listening to the show for a while know about SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And you know that the small intestine normally shouldn't have much bacteria, but occasionally it will become overgrown with bacteria. And that bacteria can produce hydrogen or some of the species of organisms can produce methane. So when you have SIBO, you can have a SIBO that's hydrogen predominant, meaning you have mostly uh, bacteria that are producing hydrogen, or you can have SIBO that is methane predominant, where you have mostly organisms that are producing methane gas, or you can have both. And they tend to present with different symptoms and they require different treatments. And so part of the challenge here has been that 
the, the most effective treatment has been rifaximin, which is a drug that's used to treat primarily hydrogen predominant SIBO. And I think if I remember off the top of my head, the efficacy of rifaximin for treating methane predominant SIBO is only about 40, 45% when it's used alone. Does that match with your recollection, Dr. Brown? Well, I think it's a little bit less than that, actually, because in their, yeah, in their target studies that they just got published, uh, they're 41% for the diarrhea predominant, which is how they got mm-hmm. their FDA approval. And so we know that it's a little bit less or significantly less when used alone for methane. Wow. Yeah, that's that's not very effective at all. Yeah, when, so that's actually why we're I'm treating all these people and they're so frustrated. As a gastroenterologist, mm-hmm. I'm frustrated. As a patient, they're frustrated. And that's why we really started doing some of the research on this. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other treatments for IBS-C uh, and why they're lacking and you know why they haven't been effective. Because uh, people are, you know, typical conventional gastroenterologist isn't even necessarily prescribing rifaximin. They're they're using other medications as a first line for this, right? Correct. So I see a lot of people that tend to fail other things. And one of the biggest issues is that almost everything out there is some form of laxative. Mm -hmm. Everybody's focusing on the colon and you're way ahead of the curve that already realizing that there's a lot going on in the small bowel that needs to be addressed. But a lot of times people say, oh, you're bloated and constipated here, take this. And so there's you know, lubiprostone, which is amatiza. We've got Linzess out there. There's a new one called placanotide, which is coming out. These all can help people go to the restroom, but they still feel very bloated and distended and have mm-hmm. an uncomfortableness. So they get very frustrated with that. And they're not really addressing the underlying cause of the problem, which is perhaps the biggest issue. Correct. That's the biggest thing is that it's just putting a Band-Aid on it. And that's why they get so frustrated and really start looking for alternative treatments. I think there were even some drugs for IBS-C in the past that, that had to be pulled because of severe side effect. I'm thinking, is, was Zelnorm one of those? Or? Zelnorm was, and it was a yeah. good drug. We liked it. When it worked, it worked really well. And in uh, fact, uh, not to get off topic, that was when Pimentel first looked at Zyfaxin. He was treating people with Zyfaxin during the day and Zelnorm at night. Right. That was his regimen because it worked as a phase three contractant. So yes, drugs have been pulled off because of that. But when Zelnorm was there, it worked only 10% better than placebo. But when it did, mm-hmm. it worked well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's also one of the drawbacks that these products that are out there are really only slightly better than placebo. And some of them can cost a ton of money. Right, right. Okay, so we have a situation where uh, the currently available treatments have been inadequate because they're not addressing the cause or when they are attempting to address the cause like with rifaximin, they're just not very effective at doing that when the cause is methane and const- you know, and the symptom is constipation rather than hydrogen and diarrhea as, as is the case with you know, uh, IBSD. So let's step back a little bit m- more and talk about the underlying causes of IBS-C. So if someone has IBS, they have constipation, you know, the the conventional paradigm, they're labeled with this diagnosis, which basically just describes their symptoms, but there's rarely any investigation into what's actually happening under the hood, so to speak. So you mentioned SIBO, but you know, what about disrupted gut microbiome in general? Have you found that that's an issue for these patients? I think there's so much overlap with this. And Mm -hmm. what happens is, is that if somebody comes in and they go see a doctor and they end up uh, maybe seeing even a specialist, like a gastroenterologist like myself, they get an endoscopy, colonoscopy, blood work. It's normal. And unfortunately, a lot of people get, you know, sort of patted on the head and said, oh, well, you have IBS. And the problem is, is that's kind of, uh, kind of a trash can diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Really, anybody that has abdominal pain, if they've got change in bowel habits, then you qualify as having IBS. And once you get labeled, I think a lot of times doctors stop thinking about what else could be going on. Right. And that's where some of the functional approaches come in. What I tell my patients is that uh, I do see a lot of people that actually improve uh, when we do treat them with atrontil. And mm-hmm. what I tell them is, is that it's possible that either you had an infection, took antibiotics, even went through a stressful situation and something shocks your small intestine. When that happens, bacteria can start to grow in that area. Then every time you eat specifically starchy foods, then that bacteria will break down the food before you can. And then that results in all the bloating and discomfort. 
Now, the interesting thing is I'm starting to see this very close link to where you're going right here, which is a disruption of the microbiome. Mm -hmm. We now know that even a lot of research are showing that we're having an overall inflammatory process that happens in the body. You can mm -hmm. call it leaky gut if you want. You can call it intestinal permeability. Whatever you want to label it, we do know that people feel miserable beyond their intestines. And that's where once you address that, and I say, look, it's not in your head. You're not, uh, we don't just pat you on the head and say this. I really think that this could be going on and this could be leading to these symptoms, not only in your intestines, but throughout your whole body. Yeah. And that's why there's such high comorbidity with IBS and depression, anxiety, you know, all kinds of other health conditions. It's not because it's just in their head. It's that, that low grade inflammation that's happening in the gut is affecting it, you know, as you would expect it to every other part of the body. Exactly. I mean, we're seeing people, and you've probably had the same results since you uh, practice functional medicine, people that have skin issues. Once you mm -hmm. treat them, it's certainly if you treat them from their intestines, their skin gets better. People that have a restless leg, pelvic floor syndrome, all these other what we're going to call trash can diagnoses, I'm seeing a lot of my patients get better after we treat them. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I just, I don't know if you saw this, a recent follow-up from an original study that was done showing like a 100% correlation between acne, rosacea, and SIBO patients. And then they followed them uh, for several years and, and found that 100% of people who successfully eliminated SIBO had a significant improvement in their rosacea. So it wasn't just an association. They actually were able to prove causality there, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, I've had patients who have been to multiple dermatologists, and I had one patient that was so sweet. She drove in from Austin, which is about four hours away, mm -hmm. just to let me know that she'd suffer from rosacea for about eight years. And after treating her SIBO with Atrantil, that went away. And she drove in to tell me so that I could let other dermatologists know. Yeah, I thought great. that was fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was great. Yeah. So let, let's talk to, a little bit more about Rifaximin, which is the drug of choice for, for SIBO typically at this point. And, you know, one of the issues that we've already covered is that it's not very effective for methane predominant SIBO. But there are some other issues too, um, like cost, insurance coverage, and recurrence. Can you talk about those a little bit? Sure. So let's look at the at the target studies, which just got Zyfaxin approved by the FDA to treat IBSD. In those studies, really it was 41% effectiveness versus overall versus 31%. So we got a 10% better than placebo. In defense of that, in my practice, when I use it on the right person, my results are a little bit better in the IBSD population. Mm -hmm. There is still a almost 60% recurrence rate with these people. So they're going to come back in. And then you did mention that it is very expensive. If you don't have insurance, it's essentially cost prohibitive. If you do have insurance, it still can be extremely expensive with uh, copays and such. Right. So the problem is that, okay, let's back up and talk a little bit. You had mentioned in the very, very beginning that you were telling your listeners about methane production. The issue and the problem that makes it hard to treat SIBO is the first thing is the location of it. It happens to be in the small bowel, but it happens to be intraluminal or inside the intestines. So a lot of the medications we've used in the past, metronidazole, sulfa drugs, things like that, those get absorbed. So you have the systemic effect and little effect in the intestines. So Zyfaxin at least is poorly absorbed. So it does seem to work in the right area. So the first problem is that. Now the problem that Zyfaxin runs into is that the type of organism that's actually producing the methane is called an archaeobacter. These are known as methanogens. And they're actually really cool in the sense that they're very old organisms. They're in their own kingdom. They're actually, they sort of constitute a domain and a kingdom of microorganisms where they don't even have any cell nucleus or other uh, membrane bound things like other bacteria. Right. They're not bacteria. They're not yeast just to fill people in here. They're in their own place here taxonomically. Yeah. So it's interesting in that our modern day antibiotics work in a way that does not affect archaeobacter. So let's look at Zyfaxin, for instance. Zyfaxin actually works by binding to the bacterial RNA polymerase so that it doesn't let the bacteria produce protein. So I think there was a paper that came out not too long ago where they talked about increased efficacy using guar gum plus Zyfaxin. Yeah. Yes. 
And th that's kind of interesting in the sense that the bacteria, the more active they were, the more they were absorbing both the guar gum and the zyfaxin because the zyfaxin had to be gobbled up. Right. Dr. Pimentel put it, you got to feed him to kill him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the things about our Archaeobacter is that it's not going to do that. And so the exciting thing and one of the reasons why we developed this is that we don't need the Archaeobacter to be eating a whole lot because the way that the Cabracho works in the conquer tree is that it actually disrupts the methane production of it and it weakens the wall of the, of the Archaeobacter. Cool. So, I mean, this is a good segue to talk about Atron Teal. And I'm glad that you, you pronounced it because now I know I was pronouncing it completely incorrectly uh, in the intro. So, don't worry. All, all of my, even my patients that love it mispronounce, I keep right. telling them it's like, <laughs> ah, my belly feels better. It's awesome. Ah, right. Okay. Great. So, yeah, t tell us a little more about how this fills the gap. You already mentioned two of the ingredients, but let's start with what's in this. And then, you know, what it does that other uh, treatments are not doing right now. So we developed this very specifically for this. And so the key to Atron Teal is that the molecules work together and they stay intraluminal, meaning they don't really get absorbed or they're very poorly absorbed. So the first ingredient is M. balsamate, which is actually peppermint leaf. It's a very, very small amount of it, but we wanted to use the actual leaf instead of the oil because it has polyphenols in it. And the polyphenols are those molecules that are good for you that we find in the Mediterranean diet and such. That calms the area down, and then it allows the other two ingredients to do their job. The second ingredient is something you've probably never heard of, and it's called Quebracho Colorado. And what that is, is that is a very large flavonoid, which also is a polyphenol, and that comes through the intestine. And what it does is it actually soaks up the hydrogen and absorbs gas. And what that's going to do is that's going to starve the Archaeobacter. And then it happens to be from the bark of a very old tree that actually has natural defense against fungus and Archaea species, which is why mm. we chose that particular molecule. And so what it does is as it comes in contact with Archaea species, it weakens the wall. Then the third ingredient, the conquer tree, which is known as a saponin, does two things. It actually kills its bactericidal, meaning it kills bacteria, but it very specifically can shut off the enzymatic production of methane from the archaea species. So to sum it up, we got one ingredient that calms the area, the second one starves the archaeobacter, and the third one shuts off the methane production. Makes sense, given the pathology of, of SIBO and I, uh, IBS. And You've done, I think, two papers on this. There it is, Atron 2. If only we had video, people could see that. You published a couple of research papers on this with the second one uh, very recently published, which I read. Thanks for sending that. I mean, one thing before we d dive into the specifics of that that stuck out in the second paper was that some researchers have suggested that people with IBS have a quality of life that is lower than people with type 2 diabetes and, and even end-stage renal failure, kidney failure. I've, I found that actually easy to believe, no, you know, having a lot of experience with IBS patients myself. I, it didn't surprise me, and yet it's pretty remarkable you know, when it's phrased that way. I try and reassure my patients. Uh, a lot of them come in and they feel embarrassed of the fact that they were told they have a functional disease, yet they're still miserable. Mm -hmm. And when we compare it to these other disease processes that sound very bad, CHF, congestive heart failure, arthritis, things like that, you can modify your life to adapt to that disease. Right. The problem is your intestines, once they're in control, you can't will it to not have diarrhea or to not bloat, to not pain. So it tends to own you and that that lack of control really wears on you it's almost like having chronic pain and so i really empathize with my patients that have this i say no it's very real and it can it's linked to depression it's linked to all of those things i think it's the number two cause of missing work too behind the common cold so this is definitely a serious problem that really can wreak havoc on people's lives and I, i've seen that i've seen patients with just a quote, simple IBS diagnosis that are, you know, have pain uh, nine out of 10 and have taken several trips to the hospital because they thought they were having appendicitis when it just turned out to be 
gas pain or, or something related to the IBS. So it's, it's definitely, a ser- it can be a serious problem. Oh, for sure. Not just for the patient, but on the overall cost to mm-hmm. our healthcare dollars. They've estimated that over $30 billion a year are actually attributed to irritable bowel syndrome. This includes the patient going to the emergency room, getting CAT scan after CAT scan, which we know isn't mm-hmm. good, getting mm-hmm. other tests done, uh, doctor shopping, having some frustration. Uh, you know, we're seeing this a lot. I think that we have shown that now you can have this post-infectious IBS, right. which essentially is SIBO. Yeah. You have these, you know, we have a lot of our veterans coming back. 20% of those veterans that get sick in a foreign land come back and then they sort of get shuffled around. And we're now showing that it's probably bacterial overgrowth and they get very frustrated. And that's a huge cost on the overall um, healthcare system. And so there's a lot more than just calling this a functional disease. This affects people's lives. It affects people's work and everything, their relationships, all of it. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit more about these, these papers. I think the first one was a clinical trial and the second one was a retrospective analysis. So we have this briefly a little bit of background on how we actually came up with these three ingredients. It's always something that my patients want to know. And it has a kind of an interesting story. When we were looking at this, when we were doing the research, I was writing on a dry erase board that ultimately methane was was the answer. And my research manager, uh, Brandy Scott, she actually is a very bright woman. She was an attorney and then got her master's in political science. I said, look, Brandy, if we can figure out how to do this, we could help a lot of these people with severe bloating. She ended up being a poli- or she had been a policy writer for a senator in Iowa. And she went, holy cow, wait a minute. Back when I was doing some policy writing, they were trying to mandate how to decrease methane production in cattle. She's like, I got a bunch of papers on this, on how to do it through food products. And that's how it all started. Mm-hmm. So that's how we figured out that putting these ingredients would be the best combination on how to decrease methane. So that led to our first trial, which is a randomized trial. We were just trying to do a proof of concept on that. And we did a randomized trial, and that was published in the Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology in September 2015. And it was pretty remarkable. We ended up having bloating scores improving almost to 91%. Constipation improved uh, up to 77%. And we didn't have a whole lot of side effects. So we knew that we were really onto something really big. And that's when I decided to put it to the test. As a clinical gastroenterologist, that's pretty cool that it works in a randomized trial, but we all know that uh, randomized trials have their pros and cons. I just want to be able to treat these people who are frustrated and coming in. So we did a retrospective study where I took people, 26 people, that had to have failed everything else available. I mean, the worst of the worst. They had to have failed Amatiza, Linzas, Glycolax, probiotics, and I'm a big Zyfaxin writer, they had to have failed Zyfaxin plus Neomycin. So we took people that really were at their wits end. And shockingly, I gave you that paper there, or not shockingly, I should say that, you know, as we expected, they did equally as well. We had almost an 88% quality of life improvement. Bloating improved uh, threefold. We had a threefold improvement. I'm sorry, bloating improved fivefold. Pain improved threefold. Constipation improved threefold. So super exciting in the sense that we felt like, wow, now we finally have something that we can actually help some of these people. Yeah, that is really exciting. And we've been using it in our practice and I've seen, seen some good results so far. It's, it's pretty early in the game for us, so we don't have as much experience yet, but we have definitely seen some improvement. And I like the idea, you know, as a functional medicine guy and someone who's originally trained as a as an herbalist uh, before anything else i'm i'm definitely interested in botanical medicine and you know i've seen the trial there was one trial that compared a botanical protocol for SIBO with rifaximin where the botanical protocol came out uh, as you know performed as well or better than rifaximin with fewer side effects and so we we have these amazing plant medicines available to us we often forget about them Exactly. And I think that was the one out of Pittsburgh there that, yeah, I saw that. The The only problem with that one was there was no real regimen for which antibiotic combination to use, I mean, herbal antibiotic combination to use. Um, yeah. But I love seeing that an academic center is at least trying it. And that's mm-hmm. that's awesome because a lot of times, and I'm just now really kind of getting involved with my functional medicine society down here. I gave a lecture where I I really believe that there is some sort of Venn diagram where we can put this all together. 
mm-hmm. you know, think of IBS, SIBO in one circle, think of leaky gut in the other, and then think of diet in the third. And right there in the middle is the sweet spot. And I had so much fun being in a room full of functional medicine doctors where I gave a 45 minute lecture and we ended up with a two hour Q and A where uh, half of it was me asking them questions and their experience and what they've had success with. And I really think that we're heading in the right direction as far as gut health, bringing a lot of gastroenterologists and MDs, speaking with naturopaths, speaking with dietitians, because everybody just wants people to get better. That's the bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of, uh, about 25% of my audience actually is uh, healthcare practitioners of some sort. So for, for their benefit and for the patients, I'm curious just to know some clinical pearls that you've discovered over, over your uh, last year of, or longer. I'm not sure how long you were using it before it became available. But you know, w- what would you tell patients or, or clinicians who are treating patients some things to be aware of in terms of a Tranto? Like you know, do, do people typically get better right away or is there a, a Herxheimer reaction, reaction type of in, in a lot of patients where they get a little bit worse initially and have a kind of you know, what some colloquially refer to as a die-off reaction, you know, what, what should patients and clinicians expect in terms of using this treatment? Absolutely great question. I really kind of uh, put these, I put each patient into two different categories. There are the ones that have mild disease or intermittent disease, and they're going to respond a little bit different. And then those are the ones that come to see me. And you probably get this a lot also, patients, to see you, that you, you may be a second opinion person. So by the time they come to yeah. see me, I'm really dealing with difficult people. So I'm going to start with that group first. What I have found is that depending on the bacterial load, really we need to hit them hard and strong, just like we did in the original studies with Cyfaxin. And that's how I explained it to them. I said, I want you to do a course of this. I want you to take two capsules three times a day until you start feeling better. And clinically, I can say that now that we've been out for a full year, uh, we've treated more than 40,000 people with this uh, countrywide. We're very open about having people contact us, give us their experience. So we've sold 40,000 units in a little bit more than a year. We know that those people that have very, very tough to treat disease are really going to take 10 to 20 days to really start feeling better. So 80% of those people are are really gonna start noticing that. Of those, I would say, and I warn all my patients about it. So I tell them that if they start feeling bad or start experiencing a die off, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I don't want you to stop. I want you to stick through it. I add a little bit of baby aspirin, which tends to help and they can get through it. And so they get very excited when they start to have that because they kind of feel like something's happening. In my own practice, I never really saw that very much whenever I would treat people with Zyfaxin if they had constipation. So Mm -hmm. that kind of explains why we're not having that kind of success with that. So of these people that do that, what I do is I have them take that course, they get through it, and then we're learning something that most of my patients, they taught me this, they just feel better if they sort of take it as a daily supplement. And the reason is, is that these are just polyphenol molecules. These are the molecules that our body really wants. And they almost work like prebiotics then. Then they go into your colon where the colon breaks it down and makes you feel better. So mm-hmm. most of my patients do a course and then they just stay on it. And then mm-hmm. as needed, go back up. So that's the really tough to treat. Now the extreme to treat, it always makes it a tough day when I show up to clinic and somebody's already holding my product and I'm like, oh no, that's all I had. <laughs> <laughs> then we sit down and talk and then we really start going through some different things. And that's where I have a, I have a, great, a great nutritionist that I work with here and mm-hmm. uh, you know, she helps me looking, okay, well maybe there's some food products and things like that. And so we do leap testing and things. And as we're going through it, very surprisingly, I've had some of these patients come back to me and say, hey doc, you know what? I increased it to three, three times a day, and now I'm better. So we know that there's a dosing thing. This is a moving target. And Mm -hmm. this, you know, we're new, we're breaking ground. And so uh, just because it doesn't work, maybe we need to add something else. And I'm talking about the bell curve here, way to the right, the people that just are struggling with everything. I have treated people with both Zyfaxin and Atrantil. I've tried Mm -hmm. putting people on erythromycin at night. And, you know, I can maybe get another 10% out of it. And so... As the type of doctor I am, I tend to just focus on those ones that don't do well. And I almost forget about this whole left of the bell curve that does absolutely awesome on an as-needed basis. 
So from a clinical standpoint, I actually have severe gluten intolerance. Mm -hmm. And when I take Atrantil with any type of uh, bread products or gluten products, I have zero issues. And it's really interesting. And so that is mm-hmm. a, uh, that's an angle that why I have all these patients taking it as needed. Um, the mechanism of action, I don't know. I don't know if we're binding zonulin. I don't know if it's the hydrogen sink that works that way. But I actually have celiac patients that swear that they can, uh, and I'm not telling anybody that has celiac to go out and try this, but they're the ones that actually say, yeah, there's something else going on here. And so that's kind of where we start thinking of what else is going on? What's the future of this? But for the clinicians in the audience, it's two, two separate groups, main groups, you know, the ones that need to take it periodically and then sort of take it as an overall digestive health. The other ones that need a good round of treatment, 10 to 20 days, sometimes a little bit longer. And then that little subset that I'm going to, you know, well, basically people like you and myself are trying to figure out, right? Those yeah. people that... Yeah keep getting second opinions. And that's what I really like when I get feedback from people and they say, hey, Mm -hmm. I took it with berberine and I had a Mm -hmm. better response. Oh, that's awesome. We're trying to figure this stuff out. Yeah, makes sense. Are are there any typical symptoms in terms of a die-off reaction? Is there anything that's typical like a worsening of constipation or even diarrhea or gas or bloating or is it just kind of run the, the gamut? I think it runs a gamut, but it, they will typically have whatever symptoms I tell them the die-off will cause. <laughs> That's the no, nocebo effect. Yeah. 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 Very I well just, documented, real yeah. deal. Yeah, I just yeah. want to realize that if you do have this, it's a die-off, you may notice some headaches, fever-like, and maybe increased bloating and constipation, and then for sure yeah. happen. So yeah. it's kind of all over. And very interesting, when we first launched, one of my patients was actually on a SIBO forum. And um, she said, hey, I took this and I got better. So we jumped right into the most difficult group. Great feedback from them. You know, we have a we have 100% money back guarantee. I just want to know why. What were your, how did you feel? What happened? Because mm-hmm. we learned. It's a learning process. Mm-hmm. And uh, that particular group that was already on a forum, had already failed everything, you know, they had kind of whittled themselves down to being really tough people. You know, those people gave us great feedback on the uh, die-off reaction and what worked and what didn't. And some of them tried Saccharomyces, and that seemed to help a little bit. And some of them took the aspirin. So I love when my patients and the internet community gives us feedback. We're just Mm -hmm. trying to help people is the bottom line. Absolutely. So what's what's next? Do you have any uh, other research projects going on or things you're thinking about for for the future or just continuing to kind of... Uh, learn more about Atron Teal and this this pr- approach? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I've got my interests. And then, of course, we do have to still pay the lights to uh, keep manufacturing Atron Teal. So <laughs> yeah. we've got, um, we're actually working with some great doctors at Texas Tech right now. And they are mm-hmm. putting together a large multi-center study that we're almost ready to start enrolling in. And we're doing that just like it would be for any large pharmacologic agent because as we start to bridge this gap between the natural products and uh, pharmacologic products, I want to hold this up to the same standards. So yes. it's going to be third party. It'd be, it'll be done out of Texas Tech. They got some great guys over there. And when we start enrolling, we would love to have you enroll people and everything. Let's yeah. do a large multi-center trial. The reason why it hasn't been done before, people... Whenever I talk, they're like, I'd like to see a larger trial. I'm like, I would like to also, except that much of this is just being funded by me and my colleagues. Actually, everything is only funded by me and my colleagues. So uh, Mm -hmm. it's, uh, you you know, everything takes money. And that's why, it's one of the reasons why we don't have good studies on probiotics, for instance. Somebody has to foot the bill. And if you want to foot the bill and then risk having your particular probiotic combination not look good, well... You're out several hundred thousand dollars. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's, it's one thing for a pharmaceutical company to shove it in the file drawer, or the, as they say, the file drawer phenomenon. That's another if you, exactly. yeah, yeah, if you're a small company. So thanks so much for, for taking the time to be with us, Dr. Brown. I, I'm really grateful that you took a risk and, and decided to make this product because I have had a similar experience to you where. IBSD and, and hydrogen predominant SIBO are a lot easier, more straightforward to treat than methane predominant SIBO. 
And so it's really, really great to have another tool in the arsenal, not only for us at the California Center for Functional Medicine, but all the clinicians I'm training in the ADAPT framework program and, and the future clinicians that I, I hope to train. So appreciate your work in this area. I do want to say one thing, and I appreciate what you've done also. You know, the uh, doctors tend to try and treat themselves. So I finally went as a patient to um, a, a colleague friend who's a functional medicine doctor, and he recommended your book. Oh, cool. cool. <laughs> and yeah. this is actually before any of this took place. So I had to laugh. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. so I think that the future of autoimmune disease lies mm -hmm. in diet and polyphenols and things like that. And yeah. uh, looking over that, and I, I, I need to order your book, but I'm going to do that and figure yeah. out what type of uh, paleo diet I need to be on. That's right. Cool. Well, thanks again, Dr. Brown. Uh, look forward to more collaboration in the future. Definitely let us know about your the new study because we have an enormous number of patients that we have treated and are treating for SIBO. So we would definitely be interested in participating. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Take care. Bye, Chris. Okay, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Dr. Brown. If you'd like to try Atrantil, you can get it in my online store, uh, which you can get to by just going to chriscresser.com and clicking on the store link in the upper left hand of that side of the website, the navigation, or you can go to store.chriscresser.com. As I said, we've been using it at the California Center for Functional Medicine and have had some really good results with some patients. So I definitely think it's worth a try. And if it does work well for you, I agree with Dr. Brown that taking a, a lower maintenance dose over a long period of time or indefinitely it may not be a bad idea, especially because of the really high recurrence rates for SIBO. Uh, studies have shown that it can recur in anywhere between 40 and 60% and up of patients depending on their particular presentation. And it's a real challenge clinically to treat these patients because even when we're successful in getting rid of SIBO, we'll often come back. So. Uh, I think having an, an option that's just a very simple combination of botanicals that patients can take over the long term rather than you know, multiple courses of very expensive drugs that have potential side effects is uh, a, a much better option in my opinion. So again, thanks for listening. I'll see you next time. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.